Good morning, everybody. Good morning. It's good to see you all here this morning. Um, as you know, uh, Pastor Dave and his wife are away this week down in Florida on vacation. So um, um, you have the B team in this morning, and so we'll fill in as best we can and uh, hope to uh, inspire you and, and help you to have a, a, good, a good message that you'll be able to take with you as you go throughout the week. Um, a few announcements before we get going this morning. I um, want to remind everybody that we need people to consider signing up for nursery assistance. Um, is there a sign-up sheet someplace for people to um, sign up? Just see Nikki. Um, we're looking for about maybe 10 to 12 people who could rotate like once a, a week through the quarter um, and serve in the nursery while uh, church is going on. So if you'd be willing to do that, just please see Nikki. That would be very helpful. Um, two weeks from today, July the 10th or the 9th? 10th. We're going to have our outdoor service down in the band shell. Um, and after that, we're going to have a, a little church picnic afterwards. Um, the food is being, the, or the barbecue is being generously uh, provided by um, Joss and Kristen. Um, and so we need other people to sort of fill in around the edges with either desserts or salad or drinks or something like that. So there's a sign-up sheet in the back hall if you're if you think you'll be here and you could bring something, just, just jot it down. It's not intended to be anything um, that should be a lot of work, but just hopefully be a lot of fun to be able to just uh, fellowship a little bit after the outdoor service and, uh, and enjoy a meal together. And from if you haven't had it, some very good barbecue by Josh and Kristen. Um, are there any other announcements that, that people would like to make? Eileen. On Thursday, July 7th, the Women's Guild and the Consistory will be meeting at the Wagners for our picnic at 6 o'clock. So, if anybody would like to join the Consistory or would like to join the Women's Guild, they're welcome to come to the picnic. Do you have to be a woman to join the Women's Guild? <laughs> we'll think about that. <laughs> we won't go there. <laughs> um, the, um, you'll notice that this morning's um, message is entitled Psalms to Praise and Worship. Um, that is being generously provided by Andy Jinks and a couple of his friends, uh, Bob Schwanger and Gary Rhodes, and thank them very much for both coming and doing that. Um, so what, what they're going to provide is sort of a, a retrospective through the centuries of Christian music and how it's evolved. Uh, over the years and over the centuries. So that, that should be an interesting time of lots of uh, different music this morning and I uh, hope you enjoy it very much. Uh, if there are no other announcements, maybe we could prepare our hearts and minds for worship at this time. I got one. Yes, sir. Years ago, besides being a farmer, I was a retail mill plant for Long Island, Clary Valley. And I used to see some nice redhead chick walking on pens, you know, and I used to come on and you know, I made some dumb moves in my life. One of the best moves I ever made was making this young lady my wife, and today she's 91 years old. Wow. And if we make it till the 31st of August, we'll be married 68 years. Congratulations. Happy birthday, Shirley. Here's to 91 more, right? Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Anything else? Rose Bittler's birthday is today. That's right. Rose Bittler's birthday is today, but um, I'm not sure how old she is, but, so we won't expect her. <laughs> or how young she is, let's put it that way. All right. Anything else from uh, anybody? All right.
Make a joyful noise to the Lord, all the earth. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come into his presence with singing. Know that the Lord, he is God. It is he who made us, and we are his. We are his people and the sheep of his pasture. Enter his gates with thanksgiving and into his courts with praise. Give thanks to him. Bless his name, for the Lord is good. His steadfast love endures forever, and his faithfulness to all generations. Would you all stand and join as we sing together our first hymn? Um, we praise thee, O God, on page two. At this time, we want to have a time of sharing our any joys or concerns that anybody might have before we enter into prayer. So, all right, let's go to Lord in prayer. Our dear Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for all of the many blessings and graces you give to us in our lives. And we just come to you now and ask that you would give us strength and courage and peace as we face the challenges that so many of us have either shared or have in our hearts. That again, we don't know why that you have chosen to have us go through these things, but Lord, help us to learn to lean on you and rely on you and seek your will and your wisdom through all the uh, challenges that life throws at us. Just pray that you will give us assurance to just rest in your peace and to lean on you and seek you for comfort and assurance and guidance throughout all of these various challenges that have been, been mentioned. We just pray that you will give those service providers, the doctors, the nurses, the radiologists, any of those who are tending to our members, just give them wisdom and insight and skill as they do their jobs and help them to do them to the best of their abilities. And then we just ask that your miracle working hands and power and grace be uh, provided to those situations as well, so that if at all possible, people might be restored to health. Um, but if not, that you just might give them your peace and love and guidance and, and fold them in your grace. We just thank you for the rest that the Bittler family has been able to have this week, and we just ask that you'll bring them home safely this week. 
We just ask for all of us this morning that we might um, seek your wisdom in your word throughout this service and that you might share with us a blessing that we could uh, carry with us throughout this week and share with others as we come into contact with them throughout the week. All these things we ask in the name of the precious Savior who saw, taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. At this time, the ushers will come forward to collect the morning's offering. Our scripture this morning is found uh, in Psalm 120, which is page 526 of your pew Bible, if you'd like to follow along. Page 526, Psalm 150.
Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord in his sanctuary. Praise him in his mighty heavens. Praise him for his mighty deeds. Praise him according to his excellent greatness. Praise him with a trumpet sound. Praise him with lute and harp. Praise him with tambourine and dance. Praise him with strings and pipe. Praise him with sounding cymbals. Praise him with loud clashing cymbals. Let everything that has breath and life praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. At this time, we'll turn the service over to Andy and Bob and Gary, and uh, hopefully you'll be entertained as well as taught. That's to get your attention. <laughs> um, so my name is Andy Jenks. I grew up in this church, uh, and um, many of you know my mother, Sophia. Uh, I currently live in Irwin, Pennsylvania, which is just outside of Pittsburgh. And I'm going to have Bob go ahead and tell you a little bit about himself and what he just did. <laughs> I just did. Well, I live in Pottstown, and... Uh, grew up in Boyertown, but my grandparents were members here. I was trying to think this morning how long ago that was. Um, it was probably about 100 years ago, I guess, when, when it started. And my mother, as she was growing up, they, uh, they lived in Eschbach. You guys probably know where Eschbach is. And uh, so, so anyway, that's my connection here. Do you want to know about the shofar? Okay. And this, this is... A, this is a shofar. Some of you might be familiar with ram's horns. Maybe you've seen those things. It's, uh, this is actually a Yemenite shofar named for the country of Yemen, which is just south of Saudi Arabia. And there were Jewish people in there that, that used this. It comes from a, uh, an animal. I, 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 look, I think it looks like a gazelle, something like that. It's something called a, a kudu. But anyway, the whole, the whole idea about this is for calling people to assemble, things like that. And to praise, praise God, um, I was reading some interesting stuff about this. That This, I believe, is actually considered kosher because it's not man-made at all in any way. It's all just take, take from an animal, uh, purely open through there, no valves or any kind of thing like you'd have on a trumpet or any, any other, or like a baritone, nothing like that. Um, so it's just natural form, and, and you're using the breath, breath, your breath that God's given you, and that's how you're doing it. You have to do some things with your, your mouth positions and how you blow it, but, but it's a natural, natural pinch, pitch instrument and has intervals. There are all kinds of interesting things. that If you talk to a physicist, they could probably give you a lot more information about how these things work. But it's, it's just neat the way God made things. So. All right, well, this morning, we're going to, the message consists of uh, this discussion, or uh, actually presentation, called From Psalms to Praise and Worship, A Brief History of Music of the Judeo-Christian Faith. Now, we're going to be presenting a variety of different styles of music, uh, a variety of different instruments, and we'll also be talking about some of the historical influences that have changed the type of music that has been appreciated throughout time. And also, we're going to bring up a few controversies, too. So, I mean, what would the presentation be without controversies, right? Okay. Now, there are a lot of moving parts going on up here, so I want to ask for your grace if we derail. That's a real possibility, but hopefully we'll see what happens here. And also want to mention, um, you can see us, but you can't see the person who's doing most of the work here, which is Nikki, who is running the sound and this, you know, pretty much everything. So uh, <laughs> please do say thanks to her afterwards, too. Keeping us in line, hopefully. All right. So we're going to be talking about um, nine different styles of music um, as applied to the Christian faith, and that would be psalms, 
chants, hymns, spirituals, gospel, patriotic music, choral, contemporary Christian music, and praise and worship. We're going to give you some samples of songs from each of these. Um, we're just going to keep them short because I understand some people like to go for lunch. So we'll, okay. All right. Now, the styles we're not considering, that's not saying that's everything. There's a lot of different styles of music which have been used in worship services or in Christian gatherings. Um, these are some that we're, we're not going to cover. So if you're hoping for one of those, I, I do apologize. Singing. So the Christian faith is a unique one in that congregational singing is a real expected component. It's commanded. Okay. So as a result, you're going to be participating too with some sing-alongs through our presentation. Now, when I first uh, put this concept together, uh, my feeling was that you know we needed to start with psalms. Okay, and because. I assume the psalm would be the first thing in the Bible. Psalms are songs. Okay? Now, they're written as poetry, but back in those times, there was no distinction between poetry and singing. So you'd sing a poet. So if you think about you know, poems and singing them, they were just interchangeable. Uh, however, it turns out that I was wrong. The first song in the Bible is actually in the book of Exodus, the second book of the Bible. Um, as an aside, actually there is reference to music or singing in 66 of the 67 books of the Bible. So music is a really integral part of our faith. You can see on the slide here the Song of Moses, uh, Song of Miriam, sorry. And so we're going to be um, sharing that with you at this time. So this is, an, this is an auto harp. Does anyone play this instrument here? Oh, that's too bad. Well, I don't really either, but I'm going to try, OK? <laughs> uh, but this is an instrument that would have been, uh, is the modern day version of what would have been used in, in Bible times. And so uh, we're going to do the melody, which has been applied more recently. Uh, of course, we have the words, but we don't Ever, was never able to attain what type of melody was used. Um, that's been lost throughout history. So uh, we'll just give this a go, the horse and rider. I will sing unto the Lord, for he has triumphed gloriously, the horse and rider thrown into the sea. Very interesting that they wrote a song after the Egyptians were derailed from following the Israelites. Okay. So we're going to now begin by talking about psalms. And these are... Do this? Yeah. These are um, songs that were written by David. Now, how many of you learned in Sunday school, little David, play on your harp, hallelujah, hallelujah? Come on. Eileen, yes. No? Don't know that song? Well, <laughs> oh, okay, she's forgotten. Okay, that's all right. We, we'll allow that. Okay. But anyway, um, there is a song about David, and um, we think of David as the king, but we also know that he was a shepherd boy, and he was a great harpist. And so what we're going to be doing is we're going to be sharing with you uh, one of the songs, now one of the psalms. Uh, David actually wrote 85 of the 150 psalms. So at this point, I'm going to have Bob share a little bit too. Okay. New Testament Christians came to faith within a pro predominantly Jewish tradition. And because of that, the first church would have primarily been Hebrew Psalms. Most, most scholars believe that Jesus and disciples sang a hymn, and they were likely singing a psalm from the great Hallel. 
And this is Andy's little humor here, I think. No. They've come as a shock to you that they weren't singing Victory in Jesus. John Tyler said that. that, that oh, did he? Oh, I thought that was your original. All right, so we're going to do uh, the song, This is the Day that the Lord has Made. Now, how, hopefully some people have heard that because I'm going to ask you to respond in singing. And I'm going to put the words up here, hopefully. All right, so basically how it works is I will sing This is the Day. You'll sing back This is the Day that the Lord has Made, that the Lord has Made, and so on. So hopefully an easy start. This is the day, this is the day that the Lord has made, that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice, let us rejoice and be glad in it, and be glad in it. This is the day that the Lord has made, let us rejoice and be glad in it. This is the day, this is the day that the Lord has made. All right, that was a good warm-up. You did, did well. All right. Now, earlier, Rick read Psalm 150, and I'd like to share with you a little bit about what he was talking about. So there are a lot of instruments that are mentioned in Psalm 150, and here's an example of what some of them look like. Uh, you can see there is that ram's horn, Bob talked about just a minute ago. Uh, the lyre or harp was what David played. The flutes, um, Bob's playing a modern day flute here, but the flutes were basically just wood with some holes in them, kind of like a recorder, uh, tambourines and cymbals. Now, we're going to be continuing by showing you some real instruments. Uh, not these, unfortunately. We don't have a museum, but uh, we do have some simulated music that you'll be hearing on this keyboard. Now, all 150 psalms were actually recorded on YouTube by uh, a gentleman by the name of Jason Silver. He's from Canada. And what he did is he actually provides a guitar accompaniment or um, piano accompaniment with some beautiful graphics. So if you have a chance and are interested, uh, I would encourage you to take a look at this YouTube video series. Um, Psalm 119 actually has six videos. If you could imagine, it would be a long time singing Psalm 119, the longest psalm in the Bible. There is a reference sheet in the back in the narthex, so if you're interested, please pick that up, and then you can get uh, more specifics about that and other things that we're referring to here today. And throughout the Dark Ages and the Middle Ages, congregational singing would slowly diminish in light of theological controversy and the ultimate, ultimate rise of the Roman Church. And the singing diminished because the clergy would assume the role of singing on behalf of the church. And this leads us to the second area, that of chants. Okay. So I don't know if anyone has... A experienced or had the opportunity to sing a chant. Uh, it's challenging because there's no musical accompaniment. It's all by ear. Uh, and it's also in an oral tonal tradition, which means it's kind of monotone. So what we're going to do is I'm going to hopefully have you chant along with me. I'll give you what the, your part will be. And uh, this is uh, the um, thank, Great Thanksgiving chant. And basically, um, here are some words for you. Words that are underlined is what I'd like you to sing back to me, and they would go like this. And also with you, we'll just give that a try. And also with you. Okay, the next part is we lift them to the Lord. We lift them to the Lord. We lift them to the Lord. And then finally, it is right to give him thanks and praise. It is right to give him thanks and praise. Give that a try. It is right to give him thanks and praise. I think you got it. All right. So now without the, the organ helping you, uh, let's give it a try. The Lord be with you and also with you. 
lift up your heart. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give him thanks and praise. So in the years 100 to 500 AD, this is the type of singing that occurred in church. All a cappella without music accompanying. Now we move to the idea of hymns, which we are, I think, most familiar with. And this is when Christian worship and study changed dramatically. Uh, Martin Luther, the Catholic priest who wanted chants and songs to be translated into German. So everything at this point had been in Latin, which made it very difficult because not a lot of people know how to speak Latin, especially in different countries throughout Europe. So he also wrote against the doctrine of the Catholic Church, uh, at that time indulgences or offerings for special prayers that were given to the priests. Um, that was an idea that he felt was um, not appropriate. So that began the Protestant Reformation. So Luther believed that music was a gift of God to be used by man for his delight and edification, also as it means for giving praise to the Creator and as a vehicle for proclamation of God's Word. There were three different views towards music for worship that were developed in Germany, France, and then the United States. First of all, in the 1500s, Martin Luther, and he just talked about it, he wrote hymns based on Ger German poetry and music. He was influenced by many classical composers, including J.S. Bach. Um, I've also read that he used some beer drinking songs because the melodies were easily followed and he just put words to those things and helped people a different type of worship maybe. But well, I think at that time beer was more popular than water, right? The water was probably was. scary to drink. You had to yeah. drink the beer. Yes. Okay, and then John Calvin wrote simple congregational songs in French and he felt only the psalms were worthy to sing in worship. So he didn't want to digress too much. In the 1800s and 1900s in America, we know about Dwight Moody and Billy Sunday and Billy Graham, and they used more evangelistic styles of music featuring common folk tunes. Again, that was for the, uh, the, the uh, people who were following it to understand better and to be able to, to respond better. Now, we're going to talk a little bit about some... Um, types of instruments that are in worship services. And typically, I think, in mainline churches, much as this one here, there is an organ and a piano. And for a lot of time throughout the 1900s, those were the instruments that you would see in a church worship service. Um, towards the end of the 1900s, drums and guitars started to come into play. And so this is also a little bit of a controversy here because some people feel, well, pianos and organs, that's God's music. But drums and guitars, we're not so sure about that. Now, you don't have to raise your hand if that's your, your opinion. That's OK. But you might find it interesting to know that um, this isn't a new concept, not a 1900 concept anyway. It turns out that there were some strong views by these different theologians. Martin Luther said the organ in the worship of God is an ensign of Baal. Not very complimentary. Um, John Calvin, the founder of the Presbyterian Church, musical instruments in celebrating the praises of God would be no more suitable than the burning of incense, the lighting of lamps, and the restoration of the other shadows of the law. The papists, therefore, have foolishly borrowed this as well as many other things from the Jews. And then the comedian of the group, John Wesley of the Methodist Church, said, I have no objection to the instrument in our chapels, provided they're neither heard nor seen. So, understandably, there was a time when an instrument in a church was not considered appropriate. And that's also in the history of the UCC church. I don't know if anyone knew that, but there was a time when instruments were not used. Everything was vocal, and the instrument that was used was the voice, God's instrument that he gave to everyone. 
Now, we're going to sing some words from hymns. We're just going to do first verses, but if you'll take your hymn Bible and find page 163, his name is wonderful, and for this, we're going to have organ accompaniment by Elmer. Uh, Elmer, I'll let you take it away. So that is a hymn from the 1900s. We're going to turn back a little bit, go 100 years earlier, and if you'll take a look at uh, number, I believe it's 659 in your hymnal, I love to tell the story. And Elmer's going to do this on piano, which may have been more uh, the type of instrument that would have been played back in that century. I was influenced to put this presentation together a little while ago by watching another YouTube video. And this is by a, a music minister by the name of David Wesley, and also available on YouTube if you have a chance to um, find that on a computer or on a smart TV. And what he does is he actually sings over 20 hymns from 560 AD, so we're going back pretty far there, right, up until 2017. And the unique thing is on the screen there, oh, let me do this, this might help. There he is. Okay, that's him six times. Okay, you remember Zoom, you know, all this business where you can multiply yourself? So he actually goes ahead and starts off by singing just himself. Then he adds himself with a harmony, three-part, four-part, and then vocal percussion. So it's very unique, and he's got a great voice. So if you have a chance, again, it's on the reference sheet in the back. we do this song? Okay. Okay. Now, most of you are probably somewhat familiar with, with John Newton and Amazing Grace. Um, I learned some things just last evening by asking the lady in my phone about this. And you'd say, do you know what I'm talking about? Uh, he, he, John Newton did have a lot of turmoil, and he had I didn't know some of these things before. His, his, his mother died when he was only about seven, and his dad was a sea captain, 
and he took him out to the sea when he was 11 years old, and he was having a rough time of everything. He had a lot of turmoil in his life. He he uh, got into drinking, and he was carousing and all stuff, stuff like that. But he did make it into the British Navy, but he deserted. And then he was, was uh, reprimanded for all that stuff. Um, he was taken captive one time by a slave trader. Uh, all kinds of crazy things he went through. But after nearly dying at sea, he just had the revelation that he's been blessed and God's protected him, and that's how he got into writing Amazing Grace. And if you listen, if you look at the lyrics, you can you can sort of see how his evolution happened with this thing and and how he was enlightened. Um, and Andy asked me to just share something else. I had an interesting experience. My wife and I were in Peru with some missionary friends of ours, and I was playing in a worship group, and we were in a big tent. And if you go to some of these foreign countries, sometimes their power system is not so good, and it, it conked out, and they were going to get a generator going. And so my, my pastor friend, Sam, you have to know Sam, he would do something like this to you. He, he says, go out here and just play something. Play whatever. So I took my saxophone, I walked to the front, and I started just playing some little jazzy thing and, uh, just to fill the time. And then I was, in, I guess, inspired to play Amazing Grace. So I'm, so I'm playing this thing, and all of a sudden, I'm, I realize they're all singing. So it's the universality of Amazing Grace. And they, of course, they were singing in Spanish, so I like to tell people I can play in Spanish, too. I think that's pretty, pretty good. I'm multilingual. So anyway, that was, that was a real neat experience. All right, so we're going to now sing Amazing Grace. And uh, Bob and I, uh, we'd like you to sing, actually. Uh, we're going to uh, hear instruments such as the flute. And this is an electronic wind instrument, so it's going to simulate different instruments. Um, I don't play the harmonica, so this is going to sound hopefully a little bit like a uh, harmonica. <laughs> So that was written in the 1700s, so we went back another um, century. All right, now we're going to switch. Spirituals are a genre of music that's purely and solely the creation of generations of African Americans, which merged African cultural heritage with the experiences of being held in bondage and slavery. So we're going to play two well-known spirituals, He's Got the Whole World in His Hands, and Swing Low, Sweet Chariot. So if you know the words of these, please join us with these. All right, so this is an accordion. And uh, I'm going to use it again to simulate a sound, so hopefully we're going to have a little bit of a banjo sound here. During the time of the spirituals, primarily the music was banjo and maybe harmonica as uh, the accompaniment. So hopefully you can sing along. If not, you can just listen. He's got the whole world in his hand. One, two, three. He's got the whole world in his hands. He's got the whole wide world. In his hands, he's got the whole world. In his hands, he's got the whole world in his hands. Swing low, sweet chariot. Come for to carry me home. Swing low, sweet chariot. Come for to carry me home.
now we're going to move to another style. I'm going to have our friend Gary Rhodes join us here. And we're going to talk a little bit about some patriotic songs. Um, so I have some questions for you. Should patriotic songs be sung at worship services? You don't have to speak out loud. Okay. Does God favor America over the other 192 countries of the world? Should we credit God in patriotic songs during worship? Well, Bob has all the answers, I think. On the next slide. Yeah, I've got them. They're all written down here. All right. Since America's founding, there have been songs about God's favor and providence. Uh, I'm sorry. This is a continuing statement about God's favor and providence shown to the United States. In the 1900s, many churches incorporated a stronger sense of nationalism in worship with some congregations bringing in the U.S. flag alongside the Christian flag, and that's what we have here. Most Americans continue to believe, as many of the songs imply, that America has a special relationship with God. Lifeway research found that two-thirds of U.S. churches include America-themed music in worship services around Memorial Day and July 4th holidays. So we're going to do two patriotic songs. I think you may know these, Battle Hymn of the Republic and America the Beautiful. And Gary here is playing a baritone horn. Uh, so now what we're trying to do is demonstrate when patriotic music is played, often it's a concert band that's playing or maybe a marching band. In fact, these guys and I once played all together with the Boyertown Alumni Marching Unit. In fact, these guys are the founders, I think, weren't you? Sort of. There you go. Okay. So they know what they're doing. Um, here we go. So we're going to do uh, Battle Hymn of the Republic. And uh, this is in your hymnal, or you can just see the words right on the screen. We'll start with a little bit of a drum sound. I'll kind of simulate some of that and maybe a tuba. Um, see if I can do that. Mine eyes have seen the glory of the coming of the Lord. He is trampling out the vintage where the grapes of wrath were stored. He hath loosed the faithful lightning of his death. America the Beautiful, got a little bit of an intro here, and then uh, again, we'd like you to, to join us. Oh, beautiful for spacious skies, for we turn to a new, another style, and that of gospel music. Okay, in 1874, American Philip Bliss wrote a collection of hymns and tunes. His music represented a new style of church music, which he felt was more singable than hymns. 
These became to be called gospel songs. While many of those songs are no longer sung, the song Hallelujah, What a Savior is one that is still popular today. All right, so we're going to do a gospel song here. Uh, it's called This Old House, and not the TV show for those of you guys that are into that. But anyway, this, uh, not the theme from that. But the lyrics symbolize how our aging bodies are like an old house. So when you hear of the shingles, uh, let's see. Yeah. When you hear the shingles, that's your head. And when we sing about the floor, well, that'd be your feet. Of course, we've got our hinges, arms and elbows, elbows and knees, and windows are going to be the eyes. So here we go uh, with this old house, and uh, clapping is encouraged. This old house was built by children. This old house was built by wives. This old house was formed in comfort as we walk the stones of life. This old house was built in laughter. This old house heard many shouts. Now she trembles in the darkness when the lightning falls about. Can you need this house no longer? Can you need this house no more? Can the time that's to the Can the time that's to Now we're going to move on to another style of music, and that of choral, or the choir music. And so uh, at this point, uh, we're going to have things turned over to Elmer. You can take a look at the screen and see some things about choral and choir music, and we're going to invite the choir to come on up. It's your turn. Hey, Nick. Am I on, Nikki? The song the choir is, is going to sing, I Choose Love, was written in response to the murder of nine people uh, at a Bible study in 2000, uh, 2017. The people of Emmanuel African Methodist Episcopal Church of Charleston, South Carolina chose love when they offered forgiveness in the face of hatred and violence. Thank you. 
We are down to the last two styles of music. Um, first, we have contemporary Christian music. Uh, so, um, this happened in the 1960s, okay? In the 1960s, everybody, everything changed, right? Everybody remembers the 60s? Try to forget it? No, maybe. I don't know. But folk music, rock and roll began, and they entered the scene. Uh, what happened is that a lot of street musicians became Christians through the Jesus movement. And lyrics were added to rock beats, and we began what's now called contemporary Christian music. So Rick's joining us now on guitar, and uh, Bob is playing the tenor sax, and I'll be playing keyboard with some simulated drum sounds, maybe. And we want to uh, say to you, uh, hold on to your pews as we play some early Jesus music. Larry Norman's sweet, sweet song. Oh, there he is, on the right side. Okay. The long hair, just like Mozart. Okay, here we go. They didn't get any applause. Just kidding. Okay. All right. In the 1980s, Rich Mullen wrote another um, popular song called Awesome God. And this began to be used in worship services. Uh, I'm going to give you the words on the screen here. Whoops. There we go. Well. Okay. And if you'd like, you can sing along with us as we go through this. Just change some different sounds here. Our God is an awesome God, He reigns from heaven above with wisdom, power, and love. Our God is an awesome God. Our God is an awesome God, He reigns from heaven above with wisdom, power, and love. Our God is an awesome God. Now, in moving from hymns to eventually praise and worship, which is where we're headed, we transitioned from looking at words out of a Bible, out of a hymnal, to looking at words on a screen, and that also moved us from four-part harmony to primarily singing the melody. We also might see how this change has happened in music appreciation from the 1940s to today. So you might have seen this a little earlier. I'll give you a better look. So in the 1940s. The family gathers around the piano, sings all the parts. And today, you know, we just got our smartphone with our playlist and earbuds. But people still do things from the 40s, too, so that's okay. 
All right, so our final style of music, style of music is praise and worship songs. And I want to mention just a little bit about them. Okay, let's just go right here. So they are, um, sorry, we've got a different monitor here. Here we go. So praise and worship style engages people emotionally. It leads to an expanded worship expression. Uh, rhythm drives contemporary music with guitars, drums, keyboards, and synthesizers. So we're going to do one more number here. Lord, I lift your name on high. And here are the words. Lord, I lift your name on high. your praises. I'm so glad you're in my life. I'm so glad you're in my life. I'm so glad you came to save, to save us. You came from heaven to earth to show the way from the earth to the cross. My debt to pay from the cross to the grave, from the grave to the sky. Lord, I lift you Turn things back over to Rick. Thank you, Andy and Bob and Gary and everybody else who participated. It was a great, it was a great presentation. I don't know about you, but I enjoyed it, and it was great to get to hear and sing many of the songs that maybe we don't hear too often in church. So thank you again. It was, it was very, very much fun. Thank you. Um, so as we leave from here, we've been blessed with a lot of praise and worship. May we go from here with our hearts filled with a joyful song in our hearts that we just share with those uh, we meet through as we go throughout the week. Uh, let us stand as we sing, um, God be with you. Amen.